All right, a lot of stuff going on in that passage, a lot of uh, great things going on. Um, but I want to talk mainly about the first part of this chapter where Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. Jesus washes the feet of his disciples. Uh, the title of my sermon this morning is Serving Your Way to Greatness. Serving Your Way to Greatness. If you want to know how you become great in the eyes of God, service is the key. Serving others, serving God. So we'll just look first at the passage in John 13 and uh, just reflect on what is actually happening here in John 13 from verse 1 and we'll read to about you know, verse 12 or so. John 13, now before the feast of the Passover when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And sometimes when I read these passages, you know, I just want you to think as we read through this what it would have been like to be one of the disciples in that room. Obviously, not really believing at the time all things, these things that Jesus was saying was going to happen was actually going to pass. I mean, uh, you can see all the way up to the end, I mean, the disciples really not internalizing that he was no longer going to be with them or he was going to die, uh, you know, be crucified uh, and rise again from the dead. So there was some somber environment here at this Last Supper uh, when Jesus actually washes their feet. So we can see here now before the feast of the Passover, so when, if you wonder when were they actually having uh, this Last Supper, I believe they were actually having it um, the night before the actual Passover day. So it was the preparation of the Passover. Uh, even though Jesus desired to eat Passover with them, he was going to be crucified or killed uh, the, the even before Passover to line up with you know, how the Passover lamb was killed the even before Passover. So it's quite interesting that Jesus was dying on the cross when all the families of Israel you know, getting together and killing a lamb uh, you know, and putting the blood on the doorposts as they did in Egypt. They were doing that at that night, celebrating the Passover. And here was Jesus, our Passover, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, dying that very same time. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So notice uh, that Judas was here uh, when they actually broke bread together. And we'll see that in another passage uh, where it proves. Because some people don't believe that Judas was actually there breaking bread. You know, they, pra they practice a closed communion. So a closed communion is like, you know, only members of the church are allowed and outsiders aren't. And they may have criteria of how they um, do this. And they'll say, oh, here, look, you know, Judas wasn't part of them uh, breaking the bread. But he actually was. And I'll show you later on. Verse 3. Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and went to God. Now, why is this verse significant? I think this verse here is significant because here, you see here Jesus about to humble himself and serve his disciples. And I think we're told here that as he goes to do this act, Jesus knows full well that he is in absolute authority, that he is God in the flesh, that God the Father has given, you know, I guess here, man, the man Christ Jesus, authority over all. Right, so knowing that Jesus is, Jesus knows he has this authority from the Father, that he's going to rule and reign. And yet, knowing this, knowing full well that he has this authority, he humbles himself and serves his disciples. You know, often we don't have that attitude, do we? We think, well, we're somebody important, or we're somebody of authority. We're, we're above that. I remember one time, you know, I was uh, having a job interview, and the person I interview, I actually ended up getting that job, but I remember the person interviewing, you know, asking me, oh, you know, you might have to do this, and you might have to do that. Is that below you? And I just, it was just such a weird question to ask, because I'm just thinking, well, I've got this job. I mean, I'm happy to do, you know, if you're my boss, you need me to do something, I'm happy to do what I need to do to make your job easier. But I, was, I, asked, I asked her at the time, you know, well, how come you're asking this question? Don't people just do what they need to do? It's part of their job, you know, they, if they, that's their boss. And she said, no, like some people will, you know, think that that's below them, that they won't want to do certain tasks and whatnot. So my point is, why am I telling you this story? My point is, sometimes we have that attitude, don't we? We think, oh, you know, we're above having to clean the toilets, or we're above having to sweep the floor, or we're above having to do this. We, but... No, Jesus, I mean, we look at Jesus' example. 
He is the God of all the universe, the creator of all. And yet, knowing that full well, he humbles himself, lays aside his garments, girds himself with a towel to go and wash his disciples' feet. I mean, what an act. Can you imagine, you know, somebody that you respect and, you know, would, I guess here, like even Peter is saying, I'm willing to die for you. This person getting on their hands and knees, taking your dirty feet, right? Sandals they were wearing. I mean, we're wearing shoes, right? At least you have socks and whatnot, you know. You know, sometimes people, you know, even with socks and with shoes, you know, their feet are quite smelly and whatnot. But here, I mean, these people are walking around. I mean, they don't have showers every day like we do. And taking their feet and washing them. I mean, what an amazing thing. I mean, what an example that Jesus is setting here. I mean, if you think you're too good to do anything, I mean, this kind of puts you in your place, doesn't it? When the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, is washing other people's feet. Just reflect on that for a moment. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So you can see here, what I think this is doing, I mean, he's obviously wrapping some sort of towel around himself. He's probably wearing some sort of thing underneath his robe, but he's obviously putting his robe aside. And most uh, movies will depict it that way. You know, he takes off his outer robe and he's got like, you know, they kind of got their undies on. And then he might put a towel around his waist, because you can imagine he's got the basin of water, he's washing their feet, and he's washing their feet, he's drying them with the towel that he has girded around him. And after that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. So he's washing the disciples' feet, he's going one at a time, then he comes to Simon Peter. Look at Simon Peter's response, if you didn't catch it when we were reading through it. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? So you can see, Peter has this reverence for the Lord, that he's saying, like, of course not, you're not going to serve me, you're like, you're my master. Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. This is so interesting that, you know, we read this passage, and we kind of know, like, what Jesus is trying to accomplish here. But even though we know what Jesus is coming, I mean, probably if I'm talking about it this morning and even uh, teaching about it, I'm probably still reminding you to be a servant, to not lift yourself up too high, to humble yourself and serve others. You know, don't have uh, a proud and haughty spirit where you're below things. I mean, like I said, Jesus is really putting us in our place here. And this is what he's saying here. He's trying to teach this principle. And this is what I'm trying to talk to you about this morning is serving your way to greatness. Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, what I do, thou knowest not now. Right? You don't understand what I'm doing now. But thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Now just think about this for a second. I mean, in our flesh, we would think, well, Peter's probably justified here. I mean, the God of the universe, like why would you ever let the God of the universe wash your feet? But just think about this for a moment. If the God of the universe is saying, I'm going to wash your feet, who are you to say, no, you're not going to do it? Right? So you see how this is sort of a false sense of humility. Sometimes people have that sort of attitude. They, 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 they find it hard to receive things, to receive gifts. But, you know, we have to understand that, you know, sometimes there's a time to give and there's a time to receive. You don't want to be the sort of person that when somebody wants to bless you with a gift or do something nice for you, that you'll say, oh, no, 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 you can't do this. You know, it's, I know some people are like that. You know, you try and pay them back money. You try and give them, give them a gift and they just won't accept it. You know, we should be, as Christians, we should be both. We should be both giving but also appreciative when somebody wants to do something for us. Right? So it's like, that's what it reminds me of here. It's like Jesus, not only is Jesus the God of the universe, he's their Lord, and he's saying, I'm going about to do this. I mean, who is Peter to say, you know, thou shalt never wash my feet. You should have just understood, hey, what's going on here? Jesus is doing something for a reason. He's doing something nice to be gracious in giving, but also gracious in receiving. Right? And I think, you know, you, you've probably been in that situation. You probably know what I'm talking about. Right? I mean, obviously, you know, it's good if people like to give things. You know, if you don't like giving things, then you need to grow in that area. But if you're the type of person that finds it difficult to receive things, I mean, have you ever been in that situation where you want to give, you want to do something nice to somebody, but you're always not sure, like, like 
oh, you know, they're going to receive it. It's like, you know, should I do it? And, you know, you want to put them in that situation, but it, if you know they'll receive it. How, 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 I mean, how many times have you ever given somebody something and they were like, wow, thank you. I mean, that was a blessing, wasn't it? So sometimes we don't want to rob people of that blessing. If they do something nice for us, be appreciative. Say, man, thanks. Thanks for doing that for me. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So you say here, was Jesus saying that if he didn't wash physically Simon Peter's feet, then you have no part with him? No, I think Jesus here is being a little bit cryptic where he's basically also using this analogy because not only is he teaching us here to serve, but he's also about to teach, you know, Peter, you know, you need to be washed, you know, with the word, washed, you know, spiritually, otherwise you have no part. This is what I think he's referring to here, because he's not saying, if I don't wash your feet, he's saying, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. But even though he's saying a spiritual truth, obviously Simon Peter just takes it as the physical washing of his feet. So this is his reaction in verse 9. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So now that he, Jesus has said to him, well, if I don't wash you, you'd have no part with me. He's like, well, then don't wash all of me then. Because you can see how Simon Peter, I mean, uh, sometimes we, my wife and I were joking, you know, I named my son Simon. Uh, I hope you're paying attention right now, Simon, looking around on the seat. I named my son Simon after Simon Peter. And sometimes I think, you know, what came first, Simon's attitude or Simon Peter? Or did he get his attitude from Simon Peter? Well, he's a little bit, I find Simon in my family is a little bit like Simon Peter. He's a bit reckless. And then, you know, because he's very, you know, black and white going one or the other, very extremes. Jesus saith, unto him, saith to him, verse 10, he that is washed, and this is why I know that verse 8, it's kind of like a spiritual truth he was saying here. Jesus saith to him, he that is washed, Needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. So you see how he's referring to here the salvation of his disciples. He knows one there is not saved, right? And this is Judas Iscariot. So he's saying to him, Hey, if you're washed, you only need to wash your feet. Why is that? Well, you can imagine in the spiritual sense, because in our spiritual life, even though we're saved, even though our sins are forgiven, we still have our daily sins that we do every day. That sometimes we just need to wash our feet. We need a regular cleansing of our feet, but as a whole, we are clean. So you can see that kind of comparison to our Christian life. And this is why you have, yes, the forgiveness of sins in regards to saving us from an eternity of hell, but we also have the daily forgiveness of our sins as we ask God for forgiveness to establish a good relationship with our Heavenly Father and have fellowship. Right? Just, just imagine it. So don't get confused with these two types of like, you know, the forgiveness of sins, right? So one, you've got the salvation. You have a criminal being forgiven of their debt in the eyes of a judge. But then you also have a father being forgiving of his children's sins. So we have both, right, in Christianity. So don't get, too, don't get uh, confused with these uh, two concepts. But this is why we confess our sins to the Lord uh, just like a child, you know, like if Simon doesn't ask for forgiveness of something that he's done, it's not like he's not my child anymore. But to have a good relationship with his father, then he, uh, you know, has to get right with his father. He has to, may have to say sorry for things that he has done. Verse 11, For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, and this is the lesson that we're looking at today, and was set down again. So he's now sitting back at the table. He said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord. Ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. So you see here that Jesus is trying to teach the lesson here that when just because you humble yourself and serve somebody else, that doesn't make you any less than what you are. You see here, he's saying, hey, ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. He acknowledges, I am your Lord. But just because I get down and wash your feet, that doesn't make me no longer Lord of all. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. So I always take this passage to in mind when I reflect on it is, I'm not too high for any task. 
if I need to serve God or I need to help somebody, I'm not you know, too high for any of these things. If God, my Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, can know that he is Lord and humble himself, why should I feel any less when I'm serving others? Right? This is the right thing to do. Verse 15, here, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. So you see here, he's again acknowledging that the servant, the ones, the ones that are below are not greater than the ones that are above in authority. Right? So he's reaffirming that fact. But he's saying, hey, I'm doing this to show you how you should be to others. The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent. So we have this amazing story in the Bible where you know, Jesus is washing the feet of his disciples. And if you just put yourself in that room, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty unbelievable, um, you know, the sort of things that Jesus did and the example that he set. But I want to add some context around this event, around what happened here. I want to go to just five different times in the gospel where Jesus is teaching this concept. And you can see that the disciples are really struggling with accepting this concept. And I, and I have uh, you know, no surprise that they would because even today people also struggle with this concept of if you want to be great, if you want to be you know, great in the eyes of God, it's not about a position, it's not about how you look in the eyes of men, it's about serving one another and serving the Lord. Let's first go to Mark 9 where Jesus first calls out this issue amongst the disciples. Mark 9, verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, what was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? So he comes to Capernaum, he realizes, oh, I mean, obviously he knows what's going on, so he's calling out the fact that his disciples have been bickering along the way. What are they bickering about? Well, let's have a look. Verse 34, but they held their peace. Why? Because they, they probably know inside, they're a little bit ashamed, that they're being proud, they're looking out for themselves, they're not really thinking about the things of God. But they held their peace. What were they disputing? For by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. So what were they fighting about? Hey, who's going to be the best disciple? Who's going to be the most, the one that Jesus recognizes the most? Who's the greatest out of all of us? They're thinking about how to be the best. And he sat down, as he sat, and he sat down, Jesus, and called the twelve, and saith unto them, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. See, if you're the type that's only looking out for number one, always trying to be first, making sure you're taken care of and not others, you're not being a servant. And the Bible's saying here, if you want to be the greatest, don't desire to be first. The same shall be last of all and servant of all. I remember when I was growing up uh, in church, you know, as a I started going to church when I was 19. So when I say growing up, I'm talking about my sort of young adult years. I remember this sermon that somebody preached at a youth camp, and he talked about, you know, pleasure's price tag. And he talked about, you know, there's always a price for everything. You either pay for it now, either with the suffering and going through the temptation, and you enjoy it later, or you enjoy it now, and then you're going to pay for it later by having less in the future. And sometimes I think about the same principle here with this, that, you know, if you desire to be first now, yeah, you'll get that now, but you're going to pay for it later. So there's always a price to it. It's just, are you going to pay for it later with less rewards in heaven? Or would you rather forego the rewards here? Or forego being first here and be first in heaven, right? Have more rewards in heaven. So you see here, this is the first time where Jesus kind of exposes this issue amongst his disciples that they're desiring this position. They're desiring this greatness. But they're going about it the wrong way. Yeah, they want it. But here he's teaching, hey, if you want to be great, then be a servant. Serve others. Think about others first. Here's a second situation in the Bible in Mark 10 where we see this same principle that Jesus is trying to teach. Mark 10. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. Now, don't we often go to God with that sort of attitude? We go to God saying, I want something, God, and now I go to Him. Is that the only time you go to God? Just reflect on your prayers. Reflect on what you want from God. 
Is that the only time you go to God? When you go to God and, and you're like James and John. You know, we ought to have some shame in that. Like when we're like James and John, we go to God and we say, I want you to do whatever I want. But oftentimes people pray like that. That's all they pray for. They want, you know, they need that job. They need that thing. They, need, they want that. They want this to work out for them. They only want God to do what they want. Have you ever prayed, not my will, but thine, Lord? I want what God wants. That should be our attitude. Right? So it should be, if thou wilt, you know, make me clean. Like sometimes people prayed in the Bible, or said to Jesus when he said, what will he say? They said, if thou wilt, make me clean. And that's the right attitude, right? It's if God wants it, then do it. Right? We would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, what would ye that I should do for you? So he's, he's entertaining, you know, to hear from them what they want. They said unto him, grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy glory. They're saying, we want to be exalted, Lord, to your right and left hand. But Jesus said unto them, ye know not what ye ask. What is he saying here? Does he say that they don't know that they, they don't know that they want to be lifted up and exalted? And what he's saying here is, you don't know, you don't understand what it would take to sit on my right hand and on my left. Why? Because look what he said: "Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with?" You know what Jesus is saying here. Sometimes people want greatness. Sometimes people want recognition, but you're not willing to do what it takes to get there. And sometimes it's like that in life too. Yeah, you're saying, oh, you know, my job sucks or whatever. I want a promotion. I want a pay rise. But are you doing what it takes to get that? You know, just in your own physical life. Sometimes we have this entitlement mentality that the boss just owes us a check. No. Business owners know that if you want to make something happen, you've got to do what it takes. But because a lot of people are employees, think about it. Most of us are employees. We don't really think about the hardship to start something up. And we just think, as long as we turn up, when we turn up year after year, and just get a raise every day, raise every year, it just happens. And when it doesn't, well, we get upset. But were you actually doing anything more for the company? Do you know what I mean? So we, we, we don't want to have this attitude, especially just as a Christian, because we shouldn't have that attitude with God. You know, God's just going to give us authority over 50 cities, 70 cities, and you did nothing for him? That's what he's saying here. He's saying, hey, if you want to be recognized as great, you want to sit on my right hand and on my left hand, are ye able? Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized of? Right? So he's saying here, can you go through what I'm going to do? Why? Jesus was exalted, but look at what he went through. Look at what he did. We want to be exalted. The question is, can we drink of that same cup and be baptized of that same baptism? But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. So this is a good principle to remember, guys, in life, not just in your physical life, but also, you know, in your spiritual life too. You want to be recognized in church? You want to be recognized, you know, in God's eyes? What are you doing in order to earn that recognition? And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. So they were upset that James and John were trying to sneak in, cut the line, right, and get in first with that request. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, so here's this lesson that he's teaching. Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. So what is he saying here? In the world... This is how it works amongst the Gentile nations. He's saying the people, they're accounted to rule, they exercise lordship over them. The ones that are great in this world have authority in this world. Right? This is how it works in the physical world. But verse 43, look, but so shall it not be among you. You see here that in the church, I mean God's house, it works differently. See, in the world, you may have influence, you may have power, you, have, you may have money, but in the world, that may grant you some level of authority. But in God's house, no. Amongst God's people, no. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you, 
shall be your minister. You see, so this is what, this is the sort of culture we want to have in this church. That we don't just lift people up because of what they accomplish outside of the spiritual world. We want to know, hey, we want to recognize and honor them for what they accomplish in the spiritual realm. Are they a servant? Right? And these are the people that we should lift up. These are the people that Paul lifted up. You know, he says, such, hold in, of such, hold in reputation. Verse 44, and whosoever you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. To, so to minister means to serve, right? So you're a minister, and this is why it's a little bit ironic these days that we have ministers in Parliament. They're meant to be a servant, but oftentimes they're like what Jesus is saying. The Gentiles, they accept authority. They just, everyone's just serving them. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a ransom for many. So that's the second one. Mark 9. Mark 10, we see here, James and John coming to Jesus, trying to be exalted. Jesus saying, hey, you're going to do what it takes. Now, Matthew 20 is the parallel passage to Mark 10. I want to show you just a slight difference here in Matthew 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. Look, then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her son. So now we realize that it wasn't just James and John coming to Jesus, trying to say, sit on my right hand and on my left. It was actually that family with the mother of those two, you know, children, coming and saying, hey, I want my children, desiring a certain thing of him. He saith unto her, what wilt thou? She saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. So notice here that that's the difference between Matthew 20 and Mark 10. Is here we realize that also the mother of James and John wanted this for them, their children. What I want you to reflect on here is sometimes as parents, we want the best for our children. You know, we want our children to succeed. We want our children to have a successful life and whatnot. Parents want what's best for their children, but sometimes the desires of parents are misguided. Now, do you think Zebedee's, uh, you know, Zebedee's wife, so you know, Zebedee, Zebedee is the father of these two, two men, right? That's why they're the sons of Zebedee. So the, this mother, obviously, was the wife of, of Zebedee. This mother probably had good intentions. You know, you think, I'm hoping, you know, I want my children to be exalted. I want my children to be lifted up. But like I'm saying here, what I, what I want you to take away from this passage is sometimes parents want what, want what's best for their children, but sometimes their desires are misguided. The way they go about it, the philosophies they impart to their children, and they can mislead their children. How sometimes? You know, sometimes parents want their children to spend more time with the family. You're going to church too often. That's misguided. Misguided that they are telling, they're basically teaching their children to put God second. Right? Instead, parents should be saying, no, we're not going to have something away from church on Sunday. We will go to church. I will be at church on Sunday. You'll never have to, you know, like my children will never have to skip church to hold something for me because I'll be at church, right? I'll make sure I'm at church. Or sometimes, you know, this always happens, uh, you know, in you know, Asian culture, you know, with, with uh, young women where uh, parents want good intentions. They have good intentions for their daughter. So they say, you know, hey, you've got to go to university, study, get a good job, make something good before you settle down and have children. Now, you see how this sort of advice is misguided. Right? Because this is not what God wants for them. It's not what God will. Remember we talked about James and John? That's not what God wants for the family. But sometimes parents want something for their children that is misguided. So we need to make sure that when we raise our children, we lead and guide and we mentor our children. Make sure you are mentoring them in the ways of the Lord and not just with what you define as success, what you want for them. Right? And then they end up chasing your dream rather than chasing what God wants for them. I don't want my children just growing up doing what I want. I don't even want them growing up doing what they want. I want them growing up doing what God wants. And if they grow up doing what God wants, that will make me happy. It will make me a happy parent. He saith unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these two my sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able 
to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. <laughs> so if you were re reading before and wondering why I was reading Mark 10 as this because I've sort of, uh, sort of memorized how this sounds. Then say unto him, they say unto him, we are able. Whoa. Do you think they even understood really what they were saying there? You know, he says, you don't know what you asked for. Are you able to do this? They go, yeah, we can. Did they really know? Well, they were gone. They're about to go through some hard times. Um, you know, so the question is, you know, you say, hey, I want to be great. Are you able to do what it takes? Yes. Do you really know what it takes? He saith unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. I just say, I just think it's funny here that he's saying, hey, you're able to do this, and they say yes, and he says, you will go through, but you know, it doesn't even mean you're going to be sitting at my right hand and on my left because it's for, his, for the Father to give. When the ten heard it, so we can see here the parallel, you know, what happened in Mark 10, they were moved with indignation. What's indignation? Hatred against the two brethren. For Jesus called them unto him and said, so this lesson again, ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whomsoever, whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. I hope you're seeing the pattern here as we're going through these pa passages. Serving your way to greatness. Service is what will make you great in the eyes of the Lord. Fourth one, Matthew 23. This one's a little bit different. Here he's rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees. But we see this lesson again. Matthew 23. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, here he's talking about the, the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They sit in Moses' seat, right? They're sitting as a judge. What do you think? When they talk about sitting in Moses' seat, is it, is it saying there necessarily that there's a physical seat that Moses sat in in Jerusalem? Maybe. Yeah, maybe there was an actual seat there that he sat in, but I, I don't think so, right? Because why? Because he didn't actually go into the promised land. So there wasn't this seat that Moses sat in. He died in the mountain. So what is it talking about when it talks about Moses' seat? Is his position of authority? Because Moses, remember he used to sit and judge the nation of Israel, according to God's word. Remember, they would all come to him. And then remember his father Jethro said, man, if every little thing people are coming to you, you're going to wear yourself out. And this is why Moses set over the congregation, captains over tens, captains over fifties, so that people could go to them first and then it escalates. It's sort of where we get this idea of our court system. Right? We got the, well, I guess the court, so the court, then the Supreme Court, and the High Court. It's this idea of that it escalates up and you appeal to the highest authorities, the highest judges in the land. Moses was at the top. So we're saying here, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat, they sit in this position of power where they're judging people. So they have this position of power. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. What is he saying here? That these men not only were hypocrites, you know, he says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and that's the definition of a hypocrite where they are getting others to do things that they don't want to do. He's saying, don't be like that because they are like the rulers in, of the Gentile where they tell people to do things that they're not willing to do themselves. Verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. You see how the scribes and the Pharisees had this mentality of they're great, therefore they don't have to serve. And God says, we don't want that amongst God's people. The greatest will be servant of all. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Right, so they have these outer garments. They want to be seen as holy, seen as in authority, respected. But when it comes to actually doing something for others, it says here they won't even lift. They wouldn't, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. They're not even willing to lift a pinky in order to do this. So obviously this is the extreme. But all of us have this attitude to some extent, I'm sure. And love. The uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Yeah, they want to sit on the right hand and on the left. But are they able to do what it takes? 
to be exalted in the eyes of God. Greetings in the marketplace and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Right? They love their titles. Be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. All right, so again, he's using the scribes and the Pharisees here as an example, that we want to serve our way to greatness. Now, the last one, the last situation I want to show you here, number five, is in Luke 22. And this one is the most interesting. And uh, as we read through this, maybe you'll realize why this all ties together. Luke 22. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But, behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. So you see there, that Judas was there, breaking bread, taking of the cup with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ allowed him. Why? Because you examine yourself, and here, an unbeliever, is taking of the bread and the cup, and eating and drinking damnation to himself. All right, this is Judas. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Now look at this in verse 23. This is where I want to sort of tie it all together with John 13. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them. Oh, verse 24, which should do this thing. And there was also, look at this, a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? So you see how they were disputing about it before in Mark 9. You have James and John trying to be the be you know, greatest with the mother. Then he's rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees to the disciples saying, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees, just wanting to be the greatest and not be the serv servant. And not a servant. And now... At the Last Supper, when they're breaking bread with the Lord Jesus Christ, did you know that amongst the table, they're still quarreling and bickering and disputing who's going to be greatest among them? And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but look at this, but I am among you, as he that serveth. You know, I'd like to think that when they were quarreling here, and saying, look, I am among you, as he that serveth, that this is when Jesus got up and washed their feet. Isn't that an amazing thought? I mean, I just, I just never thought like, man, like, you know, it puts washing the feet in a whole different context when you realize that even up till the supper, right, the night before Jesus was, or the night that Jesus was about to die, they're quarreling about who's going to be the greatest. And this is where Jesus gets up and washes their feet and not only tries to teach them the lesson, he shows them, right, this is what I mean by the greatest among you will be servant of all, that I, your God and Lord, am going to wash your feet. So we need to have, we want to have this mind like Jesus had, a mind of service. What does it mean to have a mind of service? Look at Philippians 2. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, look at this, let each esteem other better than themselves. 
right, that others are more worthy to be served than yourself. Right? This is how Jesus saw it. He even knew he was to be worshipped by the angels, worshipped by everyone, and yet he found worth in others for them to be served by him. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. There's the humility, right? The meekness, right? Knowing your place, but subjecting yourselves. Why? For the glory of God. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. See, this is the mind of a servant that you're thinking about others, you're serving others, you take joy in doing things for others rather than people doing things for you. And you know what? If you do that, you'll have a successful Christian life. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now when you see Jesus trying to teach the disciples this lesson, washing their feet, we know not only that, but he went to the cross, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So you notice there in John 13, you know, he's telling his disciples to love one another as he has loved them. So they're thinking, wow, like, you know, he's serving us, he's washing their feet. But they didn't even fully realize yet that Jesus was about to die, hang on a cross, suffer an eternity of hell in three days and three nights, and rise again from the dead for them. And this is what it's talking to us here, where Paul is teaching us here, where Jesus humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when is this going to happen? I believe it happens in Revelation 20, when death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And all of us are standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be giving glory to God, but also the condemned will be giving glory to God because they'll be hoping that they will not be cast into the lake of fire. But it's too late for them. That's why we need to be saved now and not uh, after we die. Obviously, after we die, it's too late. So you see here, this is how you become great in the eyes of God. You serve your way to greatness. And this is what we ought to honor in the church here. James 4, we see this principle. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. You know, I've heard a wise man once say, your job is to humble yourself. God's job is to lift you up. And if you start doing God's job, he's going to have to start doing yours. Right? So, it's better that you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and God will lift you up rather than you trying to lift yourself up and God having to humble you. You serve your way to greatness. I want to end on just one last verse. One last. Let's go back to John 13. John 13. He says, So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you. And this is what I want you to reflect on this morning. Know ye what Jesus has done for you. Yes, he didn't wash your feet, but he died for you on the cross to set an example for you. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. What is he saying here? I serve you. Ye ought to be willing to serve one another. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Lord is not greater than, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent, greater than he that sent him. And this is the thought I want to leave you with in verse 17. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. And this is why I think when Jesus said, you know what, you, what I do for you now, you may, you may not understand. And you might think today, how am I going to find joy and be happy serving? 
But you know what? You will. There will be some purpose. You will, you will find more joy in serving others than you will in seeking to be served yourself. And you, what I tell you now, maybe you won't understand, but hereafter you will. Right? If you know these things, what are these things? That even though God is God, He still served, and even if we may have some authority, some respect, we should humble ourselves and be a servant. Happy are ye if ye do them. Right? Not just happy are ye if ye know them, happy are ye if ye do them. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the example that you set to us. Lord, it's such a high bar. Help us to strive every day for it. Lord, help us not to lift ourselves up in our own mind or seek to be lifted up in the eyes of others. Help us to just be a servant, have a mind of a servant as you did. And Lord, I pray, you know, that in your time, you will lift up those that deserve to be exalted. So Lord, help us to all have this mind. Help us to reflect on the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the sort of God you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.